This is a photograph of Oxford University. And although I've spent about a third of my life here in South Africa, once upon a time when I was young, I had the great good fortune to study here, and I studied medieval history. And in fact, on any good day, there were some not so good days, you would find me in one of these two great old libraries doing what I thought I should do as a histor historian, which is to try and figure out a precise version of what happened in, say, the reign of King Henry II of England. And I put a lot of work into that. What I didn't realize and have come to realize since is that what's much more important and certainly more interesting is what was the story that King Henry II thought he was living in which caused him to do the things that he did. We are creatures of story. We not only like to tell each other stories, hear stories when we're small, right to the point when we die, but we also actually need stories. There's some interesting research to suggest that we cannot really assimilate and deal with reality other than through metaphor and the narrative structure that gives us a past, a sense of now, and the possibility of a future. And I'm going to pick out three essential elements that I think make up any good story. Okay? The first is that any good story presents some assumptions about the nature of the universe and our place in it. Okay? But secondly, it has to have consequences. He did this, she did that, and that happened. Okay? And of course, our favorite stories, the ones we really cling to, always have a happy ending. Now, this is true of the personal stories. I mean, take, for example, at the most trivial level, come Monday, many of us will be back at our work, whatever it is, and we'll be standing by the coffee machine, let's say, and we're swapping stories of the weekend. He did this. No, really, she did that. And no. Do you know what happened? No consequences, no punchline, no story. Okay? But we also make stories as groups, as organizations, as countries. I mean, think of South Africa, 1994. What a story we made then. And that story, which became tagged the Rainbow Nation, has given us a story that we can tell ourselves and tell the world in a way that keeps recreating our sense of what is possible here. In the World Cup just now, I think we were replaying that story and bringing it up to date, surprising ourselves because the story still works. And we tell it, told it to the world. Now, I'm going to pick three or four stories through time because I'm interested in what story we are living now and what might be the story of our future. And I'm going to go back and start in a place that I feel comfortable with, which is medieval Europe. Okay? And in medieval Europe, if you lived, if you were King Henry II, for example, you lived inside an extremely powerful story. It was the story where the, the, the core assumption was that the universe is a hierarchy of perfect order with God up at the top and layers upon layers of different beings cresting in the archangels, the angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, the pope, the cardinals, the bishops, the priests, and eventually get down to you under a baron somewhere. Uh, but what you had to do was you had to know your place and kind of stick to it. That was the imperative within your story. Then you could be part of the story. Then in the... Uh, late 16th, early 17th century, a handful of remarkable men, I'm afraid it was just men at the time, started to something which we call now the, the scientific revolution. Uh, people like Galileo, Newton, Descartes, and the assumption of the universe that they created, they kind of rejected the whole notion of there being a god and a hierarchical universe that was set in, in stone. Their assumption was that the universe is a vast machine, obedient to knowable rules. And your place in this universe is to discover and learn those rules. And the consequence is, well, if you are observant and rational, very important, you can know everything that's worth knowing. And here comes technology. You can make everything that's worth having. 
This is the beginnings of the marriage between science and technology. Bringing that up to date and building very much on that, for the last 50, 100 years or so, we've been creating and telling ourselves this story, the story I call consumption and growth. The assumption, universe is yours, take it. And consequences, well, if you're clever, lucky, hardworking, you can get more money. Money buys you more stuff, more knowledge, more experiences, and one day you could reach consumer heaven. A place of true bliss. Nobody's actually ever been there, but it's, sure, what a place. Now, something to note. The great religions, and I've just given you the, 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 the Catholic, the, the, the Church of Rome that dominated medieval Europe. But of course, bear in mind that at the time that the medieval church uh, uh, built around Rome was so dominant, its neighbors in the Middle East, in India, China, Africa, here, were telling totally different stories. So it's worth bearing in mind that for most of human history, even our most dominant and powerful and enduring stories were quite localized in their impact. This, however, the story of consumption and growth, I believe is the first truly global narrative. And it has, I would argue, even though some people, many, most people don't enjoy the full benefits of this story that are supposed to, to, to take us into consumer heaven, it is the aspiration of the, the dominant majority. There isn't a country in the world whose economy isn't trying to get to consumer heaven. Okay? Well, all was going well until about 30, 40 years ago. Oh, sorry. That we have some high priests here for this story. So the, it is a religion of sort. Uh, who are the economists, the technologists, the bankers, and the advertisers? And they've been telling us the story, refining it, and... Um, collecting the money at the bank. Now, this counter-narrative, only 30 or 40 years old, grew up with the, uh, the natural scientists who started to say, excuse me, sorry to bother you, but actually we live on a finite planet. It's a lot more finite than you economists and bankers and advertisers seem to think. And here's the data to prove it. Okay, and our place on this planet because of what we're doing, is no longer guaranteed. Consequences? Well, if we carry on consuming and growing like we are, it's lights out for us humans. Now, this is a, this is a bit of a problem here. First of all, you have to notice that this one doesn't have a happy ending. Whereas the great religions and the advertisers and the bankers and so on are very happy to tell us that there is a beautiful outcome at the end of the story. The natural scientists and the systems thinkers, these are our high priests here, they're much more cautious. All they're really saying is, if we carry on doing what we're doing, it'll be bad. What they're not saying is, if you reduce your carbon footprint, you'll get to carbon heaven. <laughs> Doesn't go like that. So, here's the problem. Although only a relatively small proportion of humanity has kind of bought this story of constraints, those num that proportion is growing quite rapidly. And there's a general disaffection that's starting to set in with the story of consumption and growth because no this consumer heaven doesn't seem to be showing up very often or for very few people. So we're now in a, in a real dilemma. Remember, we are a species that requires story. We need to live in a story, and please make it a story with a happy ending. If you pay proper attention to this story, you attend to the data, you cannot help withdrawing your support and belief from the story of consumption and growth. You can try to hold the two in your mind at the same time, but after a while, I've tried, it doesn't work. You have to buy this one. It's, it's just superior intelligence. But, big problem. Doesn't tell you where to go. Doesn't give us um, a, a story. So, 
for a creatures, creatures that so depend on story, this is really quite painful. We have effectively reached the end of our great story, and we haven't got a replacement. Now, this, this I think is a unique moment in human history. We've never ever been storyless before. So how's this going to play out? Well, you might be thinking, yeah, but hold on, what about the religions? They're still around, and they are. But first of all, I think if you've really bought the scientific story of constraints, it's kind of hard to get back into the religious box completely. And secondly, the religions, I don't see any one of the religions really becoming global. And yet we seem to be wanting to be global and become one humanity. Many trends that suggest that. So I think there are really two options. The first option, I talk to my 20-year-old son and some of his friends, and he says to me, I don't think we need a story. That's old stuff. We can manage fine without a story. What matters is right now. They may be right. It may be that I'm coming from a generation that assumes you have to have a, a, a meta story. Maybe we don't. So there's the one. And the other possibility is that we, get, we, we treat this as a once in a species lifetime opportunity to consciously create our own story of the future. We've never done it consciously before as a collective. So, just one little uh, anecdote to support the possibility that we might create a rather beautiful story, and then I'm going to end with my current sort of hunch as to what might be in that narrative. So, about uh, four years ago, the great American ecologist and activist Paul Hawkin wrote an extraordinary book called Blessed Unrest. And in it, he did some research where he he was interested to know how many organizations are there out in the world, not for profit, whose purpose is fundamentally compassionate, either setting out to heal the rift between humans and nature, or between humans and humans, kind of social justice stuff. And he, at the time of publishing, he'd gone way past a million, and quite a number of those organizations had more than a million members in them. And he, were, he reckoned that we would very quickly get to around two million. We may already be there. And here's the interesting bit, certainly for me as a historian. He asked himself, when was the first one? And here was his answer. He went back to a meeting that took place in a London print shop in 1787, in May. Twelve men, nine of them were Quakers, but that didn't, in a way that didn't matter terribly much. Nine of them were Quakers, and they met in this print shop in order to work out how to abolish, how to get rid of the slave trade, which they found offensive. And they set up the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, and that is their logo. This was the first one where the people who were setting out to help other people not only were not kinsmen, had no financial interest in their being bettered, but would probably never, ever meet them. So from one in 1787, fast forward 200 and what is it, 20 years, and we've got nearly 2 million. I think something really significant is happening. There's a huge shift, and most of those were only formed in the last 20 years. So that's just a little anecdote to suggest that we are not, that this is not a, this is not a neutral journey that's, that's taking place. And here's my, my current hunch. I wouldn't attach too much uh, importance to it. I just thought, well, if I'm going to talk to these people, I might as well give them a, a little of what comes to mind for me if I think of what might be our story for the future. So here we go. I call it the story of our conscious future. My assumption is that the universe is our home. It is intelligent. It is biased towards us and all life. There isn't one of us that isn't precisely what the universe requires. 
and it communicates with us constantly, primarily through the heart. As to consequences, I would say, be as fully as possible exactly who you are and give of yourself abundantly to other beings. You are woven from infinity, so you will not run out. And your possibilities are infinite. Heaven is here. Thank you. Thank you.